not one of those speakers that do well with a loud applause. So, so we're gonna see how this goes. I'm really, I'm really excited. Uh, I'm gonna do this more here. And hey, Connor, is it better for the video if I use the mic or not use the mic? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I like to use both my hands, so I'm gonna put this one on the ground. So you can turn it off. You're right. Ah. That moment where you're so afraid of all the feedback coming and you're like, eh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, now I know the feedback is bad. Feedback is very bad. All right, tonight I'm really, really excited and about stepping on all of Kyle's things and really ruining most of them. So that's, that's going to be the first plan. The second thing, tonight we're talking about the will of God. And I, I just want to get a show of hands. How many of you have ever thought, wondered, maybe even in the last 24 hours, God, what is your will for my life? Yes. What is your will for my life? And I want to assure you that tonight I am not going to answer that question for you. <laughs> but we're going to talk a lot about it. Because here's the thing. God is really not all that concerned with telling you what you're supposed to do with your life. Because that completely removes the need for faith. Faith is an absolutely essential part of your walk with God. And if God says... Here's what you're supposed to do the rest of your life. If you're completely honest, most of us are going to throw up a holy salute. Thank you, Jesus. And you're going to walk on with your life without a second thought. Because you now know what you're supposed to do. So what we're going to be talking about is not, not the answer to what you're supposed to do with your life, but why is faith so important and how you can trust God with sometimes the lack of information that you have about what you're supposed to do. So I want to start with a story. One that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but I'm only going to give you half of it, and then we're going to come back to it. How many of you are familiar with the name Jim Elliott? Few, few scattered. Few of you that went to Christian school know about it. <laughs> yes. So, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Ed McCulley, Roger Yurdian, Yurdian, and Pete Fleming were missionaries in Ecuador in the 19, early 1950s. They took their families, their wives. They all have one wife, singular. One wife. <laughs> but they had multiple children, and they took them to Ecuador to minister to the, the, the Quechua in, in, uh, Indians there in Ecuador. After a few months of, of living down there, they, Nate Saint was, was a pilot. What they would do is they knew that this is a particularly aggressive group of people, and so what they would do is they would fly the plane, and they would actually drop gifts down, like food, different things like that, to begin to show that, hey, we're here to help you. Uh, we want to have a, a peaceful contact with you. They did that for months. Then after for a while, they were praying about it. They decided, hey, I think it's time for us to actually meet these people. And so they did. They landed on a beach, and their first contact with them was great. Uh, they, they didn't know the language, but they were able to give more gifts. They even took one of the, those people uh, into, uh, into the airplane and gave them a ride and dropped them off, and it was great. They were so excited that God was blessing their mission had, and they were obviously walking in God's will, and it really seemed like God was using them with those people. But then they they had a second contact. They landed, and rather than being greeted as they had last time, there were ten or, or fifteen of the Quechua people that came with spears and speared all five of them to death. And that was January eighth, nineteen fifty six. All five of those men were killed. Left widows left children without, children without fathers. Could that have been truly God's will for those five people? Could that have been God's will for those kids and those wives? When we are asking God for the understanding of his will, so often we are much more concerned with what are we supposed to do next in our lives, more, the, more so than being concerned with the, the attitude of our heart being in line and in step with what God really wants us to do. And, and that is the problem that we have, is that we're much more concerned about ourselves and us having full knowledge of what we're supposed to do than really caring at all what God wants us to do and what the effects of just following Him would be. This reveals that we are ultimately more concerned with knowing what we are supposed to do rather than desiring that our hearts, attitudes, and actions being aligned with the Spirit. This reduces God to just a genie in the bottle and reveals our true lack of faith. 
If you're a note taker, I want you to write this down. This is a, the, a key part. The will of God and faith are inseparable. The will of God and faith are inseparable. Our key verse tonight is Colossians 1, uh, 9 through 10. And uh, so I'm going to read that for you, but feel free to open up to your, in your Bibles. So Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10. This is Paul speaking. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul is praying for the Colossians that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will for their lives. But the key to understanding this verse is in verse 10. Is in verse 10. Why are we supposed to? Why are we supposed to understand God's will? I, I can't say that was a question I ever asked. Was, well, obviously I should understand God's will, so I'm do what I'm supposed to do. But the reason this verse tells us why we're supposed to understand it, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. When we sit and when we're frustrated that God doesn't tell us what we're supposed to do because. It's because our focus is in the wrong place. The heart of the matter is that God is jealous for his own glory, for our full devotion and our full dependence on him. This verse makes it incredibly clear that the purpose of understanding his will is not so that we know what major we're supposed to, ta- supposed to be, what vocation we're supposed to have, or who we're going to date. That's not what his will is there for. That's not why he reveals it to us. He reveals it for the sole purpose that we could walk in a manner worthy of him, be fully pleasing to him, bear fruit, and increase in the knowledge of him. And like I said before, if you were to just show us everything we were supposed to do, what need for faith would there be? This is, faith is the surrender of self to the will of God. Colossians 1 gives us a promise, something that you can hold on to, because every promise of God comes true, without, without fail. Colossians 1 gives us a promise. When we willingly submit to God's will for our lives, we will be walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. We will be fully pleasing to Him. And we will bear fruit, and we will increase in the knowledge of God. A key part to that is when we willingly submit. First off, you have to understand, you cannot ruin God's plan. You, can't, you cannot mess up his plan. His plan cannot be thwarted as we're going to be seeing in scripture. But the question is, if you can't ruin God's plan, but there's obviously some sort of contingency on if we walk in a manner worthy of him and if we're pleasing to him, and that's if we willingly submit to God's will. God is going to use you. The question is, is, is he going to use you in your obedience or is God going to use you in your disobedience? He, you are going to be used it's up to you to see how, you're, how he's going to use you. So let's think about this. If God wants us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit, etc., etc., why doesn't he just tell us what we're supposed to do? It, 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 just wouldn't be that, it just wouldn't be that helpful. It would be a lot more helpful if he was just like, hey, this is what you're supposed to do, rather than us wandering around in the dark looking for what we're supposed to do. Like we said, we talked about faith. But what I want us to look at is a very, very well-known passage that... I never thought of as a passage a lot about faith. If we look at Psalm 23, most of us know it by heart. We've been, it's been on our baby walls or been written in our Bibles, lots of, lots of things. But I'm going to walk us through this, and I want you to see how this is actually a hugely about faith. So the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What I want you to get from that is that I am not your shepherd. Britt and Mitch are not your shepherd. Your pastor is not your shepherd. They may help shepherd you, but they are not your ultimate shepherd. Not even Connor is a shepherd. Even though his name is Shepherd, he's still not the shepherd you're looking for. <laughs> so don't go looking to Connor for these answers. He's not going to be able to help you. Only the Lord is your true shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Why does he make you lie down? You would think that that would be a very logical place for you to lay yourself down by the green pastures, obviously. But in our in 20th century, 21st century Christianity, we are so concerned with going and doing and trying to prove to God how devoted we are to him that we are just going to keep going, 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 and we completely forget 
that God wants us to stop and rest. We, we are so concerned with making sure we are doing everything that God wants us to do, that we are following his will, that we are not willing to stop and wait and listen to him. And so he forcefully makes us lay down in green pastures and he leads us beside the still waters because we are too stupid sheep to, to stop and wait and listen. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Now, now notice, this is the first time in this passage, passage that we are doing anything. And what is the first thing that we do? We go walking in the valley of the shadow of death. Why would we do that? I don't know. But it's what we do. And, and we have our first moment to walk, and that's where we go. You stupid sheep. I don't get it. So rather than let him lead you, which he obviously wants to lead you by the green pastures and by the, the, the still waters, but we decide to walk in the valley of the shadow of death. And yet, we, and we don't willingly submit to his will. We try to do it on our own, and yet God is with you. No plan of his can be thwarted. This is incredible. We're going to keep going through this passage. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, I want to stop here. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to have Rob's banquet table set up, I don't really want it set it in the, in the presence of my enemies. I don't want it there. How about, what about those green pastures? What about that still water? Can we do a banquet there? Maybe that would be great. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not doing it there. We're doing it in the presence of our enemies. But here's the thing. This, this is a promise. God is promising to protect and to provide for you even when you're in a bad spot. And we're going to see this, this theme of, of protection and provision and his presence being there in, in the bad spots over and over and over again in Scripture. That's what's so exciting. So remember, the promise to protect, to provide, and for his presence. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. This is the, is the part that wrecked me. This is the part about faith that I had never heard before, but that changed my life this last summer. Why do goodness and mercy follow me? Uh, I feel like I would want goodness and mercy to be out ahead of me so that I could see that where I was going was full of goodness and mercy. But, but no, it's behind me. It, it follows me. This is because over when you read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you see in the New Testament as well, but especially in the Old Testament, over and over and over again, God says, remember how I brought you out of Egypt? Remember how I gave you the, the land of Canaan? Do you remember how I provided for you over and over and over again? He always tells them to remember so that they can have faith to move forward. It's because of that goodness and mercy that follows them. They go, oh yeah, look how God provided. Now I know that I can go forward and that he's going to be with me. That God... How many times can you, how many of you can look back in your life and see a time that God provided for you? And yet we're so afraid that if we step forward, that if we trust him, he's not going to be there. But even in the presence of your enemies, he provides a banquet table for you. How much more when you're actually obeying him and willfully submitting to his will is he going to provide and protect and have his presence there with you? And, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. His presence will be there with you always. We see a very practical example of this faith with Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and him, him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. In this passage, we see, and so, oh, sorry, continue on with verse 4. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. God did not make his plan known for, him, for Abram, but he did give Abram a promise. A promise of presence, protection, and provision. He says, I will go with you. I will be with you. And, and go to a land that I will show you. He doesn't say, go till you reach the land of Canaan. He doesn't say, go till whatever you see this big rock and you should stop there. He says, pack your stuff, get on Interstate 24, and you start driving, and I'll let you know when to stop. This does not make sense. 
But the promise was given that I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless, I will protect you. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And he promises that he'll be with them at all times. So now that we've talked about the need for faith as it relates to God's will, I want to talk to you about how, of what we do know that God wants you to do. What, what part of his will do we know? Because there is a difference between God's, God's specific will for your life, what, what job, what major, what blah, 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 all this stuff. There is a difference between that and God's general will, what is true for all believers. And this, the first, the first time I was taught this Colossians verse, which was last February here, um, I, I think I misunderstood the passage a little bit. I taught that God's will for your life was that you should walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That your, your purpose is to, uh, to do all those things that the Colossians verse talks about. And I don't think it's necessarily false. But God's will is not just go and do good things in my name. That's true. We should go do, do and do good things in his name. The Bible is very clear about that. But that is not your ultimate purpose. It's just to do good things. It, our purpose is not just to haphazardly run around doing good things. So we should. He, he has a plan for you. He created you specifically it, with a purpose that only you can fulfill. It, and in Psalm 139, we see this fleshed out. This is 139, verses five, uh, 15 and 16. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Before you were born, every single day of your life was planned, it was planned out. We were created with a purpose in mind by God, a purpose in mind by God, and a role to fulfill in His masterful, in His masterful sovereign plan. But God does not always make known to us what that role is. But God has revealed His general will, will to us. Listen up here. This, this is the key. This is one of the most important parts of this entire talk. You must understand this in order to walk as a faithful disciple. Jesus gave you a very specific command that was that that this is the purpose of your life. And it's this command is in the shadow of the greatest miracle and in, in just upset in, in the course of history, the resurrection. Matthew 28 begins with Jesus being resurrected. And I feel like, especially with Easter coming up, we thought about the resurrection, we've been in church, we, we, we hear this all the time, but I think, have we lost the grandeur of what a resurrection is? A dead body that has been in the ground behind tons of stone for three days is now alive and still doing miracles and is saying, hey, I have a command for you. And you're like, a dead body is telling me what I'm supposed to do. Maybe I should listen to this. Yes, you should. That's why Jesus starts with the resurrection. And he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Hold up. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is a dead body speaking. That's now alive, saying that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. Now he has a command, so we better listen up. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go and make disciples as God's general will for you. If you are truly a believer and truly a disciple of Christ, this is your will. And if you are not following this, then you are not obeying Jesus' command. Think about that. God has made his will clear for you. This is what you're supposed to be doing with your life. How are you supposed to do that specifically? You don't know that yet. But you know that if you're truly following Christ, you will be following this plan. So your question shouldn't be, am I supposed to do songwriting or audio production? Am I supposed to be studio dance or should I be engineering? Your question is, how can the, the, my talents that I have, how can they fit into the great commission of fulfilling the gospel so that this could be the generation that sees the great commission fulfilled? That is possible. That is possible that this we could be the ones that get to usher in the kingdom. But we're so concerned with who are we going to date that we miss that. Is it important who you're going to date? Yes. Is it as important as the coming of God's kingdom? No. 
you got to get over yourselves. <laughs> there are bigger things. There are bigger things you need to go to date. There really are. There really are. Wow, it's hot in here. Oh. <laughs> Golly. So just like Abraham was not told exactly where to go, he received promises that God would, his presence would be with him, he would be protected, and he would be provided for. Jesus does this for us. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He promises his presence there for us. He, he says, I, I, your spirit, I'm, the spirit is going to come and he will dwell within you. He promises that he will provide for us with the spirit. He promises that he will protect us. With And, and Romans 8.28 it says, and, and, uh, and surely I will work... Uh, it, Sorry, I have it right here. And he promises that God works all things for the good of those that love him. You can't misunderstand this verse. The good of those that love him doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get what you want. Because sometimes the good that has to come has to come through painful situations. And some of you may be sitting here going, Rob, what about these terrible things that are going on in my life? What about this person that's intimately close to me that just passed away recently? How could, how could God be... How could this be part of God's will for me? Isn't this just a part of the fall? How, how can God work this for the good? I think those are the very questions that Job was, at, was asking. And God had a very specific response for him. One that isn't the most comforting thing ever. This is in Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Hello. Out of the whirlwind? Hold up. Okay, God's answering out of the world, and I guess I'll, I guess I'll listen to this. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, and I will question you. And you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or, or who shut the sea with its doors? When it, when it burst from the womb, when I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Now God doesn't stop there for the next two, three chapters. He continues. And the Lord said to, J uh, to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues, God, argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay a hand upon my mouth, I, I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice. I, I will proceed no further. I, I'm done. I'm, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Who was I to question you, Lord? Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. You will make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that I, I, may, be in the, I may be in the right? So that, so that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God that you can thunder with a voice like his? Then at last, after, after three chapters of this, in chapter 42, Job repents. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know you can do all things, that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, wonderful for me which I did not know. Things too wonderful for me that I did not know. This is the man that is saying this after he's lost everything. His, his wife has told him to curse God and die. His children are gone. His money is gone. His home is gone. It would seem as though his protection, his provision, and God's presence was gone for him forever. And yet he says, I, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. He is a man that has been truly humbled before God. He is a man that understands where he's supposed to be. We must begin in this place and we ask God what his will is for our life. Because we don't get to dictate that. We don't get to dictate what is good and what is bad, what should happen to us, what we deserve to happen to us. We are of small accord. We can give no answer for what God should do. But what we know is we have a promise. We have a promise of his provision protection and of his presence. This is where I want to return to the story of it in Ecuador. Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot's wife, and, and Rachel Saint, Nate's, uh, Nate's sister, decided to stay and continue the ministry, uh, continue the ministry there with the Quechua Indians. And 
very shortly, I don't understand how or why, but these people began to change. They began to surrender their lives to the Lord. The, the wife whose husband was murdered by these people, the, imagine your, your brother or sister being speared to, to death and then going to that person that did it and trying to preach the gospel to them. They stayed. They raised their kids there with those Indians. And, and later on, Steve Saint, Nate's son, would grow up and he would become good friends with one of the, one of the Quechua people named Min Kaye. He was one of the very warriors that speared his own father, that speared Nate's father. Minkaye was baptized by two of the other warriors who, who were a part of that group that killed the, the missionaries. And, and Minkaye and Steve would travel around and tell others about Jesus, and, and Minkaye would tell them about the forgiveness that he experienced from Steve, but most from Christ. No purpose of God can be thwarted. Jim Elliott and Nate Saint were completely in the will of God. And they knew that. They were willing to go and try and fulfill the Great Commission however they felt God lead them to do, even though it didn't make sense and even though it led to their death. And they were given protection. Think about that. They had to get from, in, in the 1950s, when things weren't quite as, as sophisticated as things were now, they had to fly from, from the U.S. down to Ecuador. They flew planes over the jungle where I'm sure there was lots of disease. Why didn't they die before? Why didn't they? Because God was protecting them so they could fulfill their mission of being killed at that point so that those Indians could truly understand the, what grace and forgiveness and love truly looked like so that that wife and that sister could come back and say, I love you in the name of Jesus Christ even though I've lost everything because of what you've done. This, it, this isn't just fantasy, this is real. This is what God could have in store for you. Do, does it mean that you're going to be killed for your faith? Probably not, but could it? Maybe. And that would be God's will. Because God's will cannot be thwarted. Jo Job knew this, that God is going to do something, and he will bring it to completion. That's another promise he gives. I will bring to completion the good work that I started in you. He promises that. So, so if no plan of God can be thwarted, then what is our role in this? It's faith. God has promised, his, promised us his presence, his protection, and his provision. All to the end that his name is going to be made great, and you are going to be ultimately dependent on him. You don't need anything else. I want to share one more story uh, from the book of Jeremiah. And I, it just sums it all up. This is uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, this is Jeremiah speaking, came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you, and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Did, did that first part sound familiar to anybody? Psalm 139. He's quoting it directly. And then I said, Ah, Lord God, well, hold on. I do not know how, how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to, all, for, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Now, he doesn't say what he's supposed to say to him. He just says, everything I tell you, you're going to say, and I'm going to be with you when you go there. He's promised his provision, his protection, his presence once again to Jeremiah, just a boy. Then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And see, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and to overflow, and to build and plant. This are the exact same words that Jesus gave to you. He has put his spirit inside of us. And he has set us above the kingdoms of darkness. He has given us dominion over demons to cast them out, to heal, to proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus gave us that authority to do those things. And, and to, to break down the, the, the strongholds of sin in people's lives. We've been given that mission. And, and God's spirit resides within us to help us fulfill that role. 
So as it, as it, as it comes to God's will for your life, it, do I hope that you know exactly the next step that you're supposed to take? No, I really hope you don't know the next step you're supposed to take. But I do hope that you sit here going, I'm content to have faith. And, and having faith and not knowing, rather than thinking of that as this bad place to be, that, oh no, what am I supposed to do? What if you were actually able to rest in the green pasture and by the still waters that he's brought you to of, I don't know, but I'm the, the will of God cannot be thwarted, therefore I am exactly where I'm supposed to be at this moment. If our lives can be characterized by rest and waiting on God and, and faith, how would that change your life? Maybe stress would be alleviated. Maybe you would stop worrying about messing everything up. Because ultimately, who are you to, to say that where you are isn't the right place? Or who are you to mess up God's plan? You're thinking way too highly of yourself. You really are. God is in control. Your role is to walk by faith. And as he, think, as he makes things clear to you, as he promises, your word is a light to my feet and a lamp into my path. Once you understand the Bible, you're going to understand God's will. But until you understand everything, you're not going to know God's complete plan for your life. So walk in faith, and God's protection, his provision, and his presence will be with you always until the very end of the age. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this evening. And God, I pray that you would help us just to be content with knowing that you are with us, that you are providing, and you are protecting us. Lord, you are in control of all. And uh, God, I pray that you would help us to trust you and to surrender our wills to your will, and that we would willingly submit to you. Heavenly Father, we love you and we trust you. Thank you so much, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made, that you've made it possible for us to have a relationship with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.